Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of the Sky F1 vodcast, in which we're going to be celebrating the life of Sir Sterling Moss, who sadly died in the early hours of Easter Sunday. What a career, what a life he lived. Many people said he was the greatest driver never to win a world championship. Nevertheless, he won uh, so many races over the course of his career, finished runner-up in the F1 World Championship four times and came third on three further occasions. He also won the Milia Milia in 1955 and we're going to reflect on all of those achievements today and discuss the man and his legacy with some friends of our own. I'm delighted to welcome today uh, the 1996 world champion Damon Hill, Martin Brundle and Johnny Herbert and also Sir Jackie Stewart. Sir Jackie, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. I'll come to you in a, a few moments time but first of all I'm just going to ask our regular gang about Sir Sterling his legacy, what he meant to you and what he meant to British motorsport. Martin, starting with you. Absolute inspiration. We looked up to him. And the fact that we all knew him so well tells you about the, the character, tells you about the man himself. He was, he was generous. He was out there. He was a, a great ambassador for motorsport in general and British motorsport, and particularly the British Racing Drivers Club that he was so proud of. Uh, and, you know, I... He, his achievements in single seaters, in sports cars, in rally cars was was just outstanding. So, uh, and a privilege to know him. You share a birthday with him, Damon. He was there at your christening. Um, you've known him all your life. Well, yeah, I've known him. Uh, well, as you said, he was he came to my christening, but he really knew my dad. Obviously, that's why he was there. Um, and I've got some fantastic pictures of, of the gangs. Uh, at, at my christening when I, uh, back in 90, well, 1961, so just before his accident. But so he was, but what he meant to to us, I think the thing about, with uh, Sterling was, I think he was also a celebrity. So perhaps because of his career being cut short, he went out into the public and he became very well known um, and did a lot of commercials and, and cam campaigned for, uh, for motorsport and, and was a great promoter. Of, of Formula One and, uh, and of the sport. Well, Johnny, ultimately, he was a, a driver's driver. Everybody you talked to um, was in awe of the way he could command a car. Yeah, and I think that is what I, I remember uh, of him. You know, I met him, I think, in 1987, I think it was, when little Elliot, I remember his son running around his house in London. Uh, but I remember the first sort of five minutes of that conversation where he said, oh boy, uh, men mental uh, toughness is something that you've really got to work on. And I think that was the key to what Sterling was all about when he was doing his various races. His mental strength was very, very strong. But as a character, he was always there, like, like Sir Jackie, always there to help the newer generation. And they still have an understanding of what these modern cars are all about, similar in when I was doing Formula 3. But that help was always there. So a, a good friend, and of course, Lady Moss as well, was always, always by his side. So Jackie, um, your godfather to his son, you knew Sir Sterling better than any of us. You got his autograph back when you were 14. But if you go back to that era, the bygone era of the 1950s, and you think about what it was and what he encapsulated during that era, it was a time of economic restraint, recovery after the Second World War. And it, it struck me as if Sir Sterling was a sort of beacon of glamour in those, in those relatively austere times? He was a giant. Uh, he was the very best of his time. Uh, keep in mind that this very day is Easter Monday and Sterling Moss in those days would be at Goodwood because there was an Easter Monday Goodwood bigger event and that Sterling would be at. Sterling was so charismatic all his life, uh, because I, as a wee boy, went to, to many of the races that Sterling was at with my brother Jimmy, who drove for a courier course. And I got Sterling's autograph when I think I might have been 14 years of age. Uh, and one of the nice things about it, the, the boys will understand this one. Um, you could read Sterling Moss's autograph, clear as whistle. Now that doesn't happen. I learned, because... The one thing I hated was, and I was getting to the Grand Prix and so forth, at the British Grand Prix, all these drivers would scribble their name. And when I got home, I would say, look, I've got all these autographs. And I wouldn't be able to tell who it was, but Sterling Moss's, you knew it was clear as whistle. And 
I learned from that. And that's why my autograph today is still very clear. But that's the sort of thing that Sterling Moss would have thought about. Um, he was the professional. It's, it's already been recognized by all that you've got there. Uh, he was glamorous. He was colorful. He was exciting. I, I've been saying it for the last day and that, well, half a day, really. He walked like a racing driver. He talked like a racing driver. He looked like a racing driver. He was dynamic and he always dressed so well and presented himself well. It was just, he was an amazing man. Jackie, what would you say was his greatest race, his defining moment? I think the one he'll be remembered most for was the Mille Miglia, uh, because he did it such a fast passion uh, with, you know, in a way that was completely different from the almost amateurs who were winning um, the that that race. Um, they were just experienced drivers, but they weren't Grand Prix drivers, most of them. And he just went in there and beat them all so magnificently. And with Jinx with him, obviously, it was a real double act. Um, his other drives, I mean, I'll never forget seeing him at places like Goodwood. Uh, you know, he, the cars then had, you know, no grip in comparison to today. And his balance with the car was so clean, you know, and we know about it in modern Grand Prix racing, overdoing the tyre temperatures. Sterling Moss would never have overdone the tyre temperatures. He just had it right at the edge and never ran out of tyres. That type of thing was his speciality. Jackie, um, it, you um, you got to know him uh, as a as an individual as well. How can you describe him? We've we've heard a lot about his driving and and his public image, um, but I didn't actually get to know Sterling. I heard lots of stories about people visiting his apartment. He's quite an eccentric person, wasn't he? He liked gadgets. Yes, his whole home is a gadget. Um, I mean, there's some great stories about Sterling building the home that he he's passed away in. Um, he was a gadget man. Um, the best story I have of, of Sterling really is him saying to John Whitmore and I, you've got to come and see the house. We're, we're finished the house, but you've got to come. So we get there and we go upstairs. There's no elevator at that time in the house. So we we'll go upstairs to his bedroom. He says, no, you've got to lie in the bed. And we're saying, we're not going to lie in the bed. Whitmore and I lying in the bed. He says, yeah, but wait till you see this. And he had got the whole system that he pressed a button because everything in the house was buttons. The, the, the water temperature in the bath was done by his bath, by his bed. Anyway, in this particular case, he had a television set coming through the ceiling so that he could lay back and not have to, you know, stretch himself to, to see. And this was his big thing. So he presses the button. The television set comes down and suddenly it demolishes itself on the floor. <laughs> and when and I thought it was World War II, uh, it, was, it was the sort of thing that who would have thought of putting a television set in the ceiling so that it came down, you wouldn't have to turn your neck to watch TV. That was Sterling Moss uh, and all his gadgets in his house. Uh, and he was such a charmer with it. Of course, when that happened, he had no excuse at all. <laughs> but his gadgets nearly finished him off, of course, 10 years ago. Yeah. Do you remember when he yeah. stepped into his lift that he built in the house and the lift wasn't there and he fell three floors down the, the lift shaft and broke loads of bits, his ribs, his oh. vertebra, and still he came back, Jackie, didn't he? Well, I saw him two days after the accident. I went to the hospital to see him. And, and the elevator, by the way, I've been in the elevator and it's now not used much. The, uh, Susie doesn't like being in the elevator, but it had just come back from, I think Williams had done the interior of the elevator for him and it was black carbon fiber. And when he pressed the button, the gate opened, but of course it was black. So Sterling just walked in, bang, down he goes. Can you imagine the impact? And his, you know, his ankles, his feet, and his knees. I went to see him the next day, and it was, hello, boy, how are you, says he, because he we'd always call you boy. Um, and I said, but Sterling, what, how's it went wrong? He said, oh, damn thing. And it was, it was out of his mind. 
And within no time at all, he was back. His recovery, uh, he was such a strong man. I saw him, I suppose, what, four weeks before he's passed away. His upper body was still strong. I mean, he still had a definition. I mean, he was a very strong man. And to recover from that accident, <laughs> It was amazing to me. I mean, I didn't think he was going to be walking for, I don't know, half a year. I mean, the impact of a hell of, I mean, just extraordinary. So he was a brave man. Of course, he had accidents. And of course, those days, the cars were not as reliable as they are today. And certainly, they weren't as protective as they are today. So, you know, he survived when many others didn't. And so, Jackie, that sort of shows his mental strength as well, doesn't it? Because you were very much sort of getting safety into Formula One. But so Sterling always wanted an element of danger. And I, did that help him back in those sort of that 50s era? Oh, you didn't approve at all of what I was doing no. <laughs> with, with regards to safety. I mean, oh, that was, I mean, he was really upset with me. Because, you know, you, you, hey boy, you've got to, you know, you're, you're a man, aren't you? And you're going to be a pussycat. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, he, it was just the era, I think. Yeah. But, I mean, keep in mind that when Sterling started his racing, it was at the end of the war. And everything was very open. I mean, there was no runoff areas. <laughs> I mean, there was no deformable structures. There was nothing. I mean, you, if, when he had his accident uh, at Goodwood, if it were like today, he would have survived it. So he didn't think of it that way. You know, boy, if you don't want to do it, why, why, why don't you step back? Uh, and, you know, I didn't have an answer for that. If you look back at his career, Sir Jackie, um, between 1948 and, and 1962, in that 14 years, I think something like 180 drivers died, 50 of which he, he, he knew personally. But, but I wonder, um, in the fact that he didn't become world champion, how much was that a result that he had to drive during Fangio's era? And how much was it a result of the fact that he only wanted really to drive for, for British uh, manufacturers, if you like, and the, and the small privateer teams? Absolutely, and they were rare. I mean, there was a Connor and there was a Cooper. There even wasn't a Lotus uh, at that time. You know, he wanted to drive British. He wanted to drive with a British entrant. He, he, he loved Rob Walker, for example. Uh, he it was just, that was the type of man that he wanted to be with, or Tommy Sockwith, for a lightweight E-type, uh, not a lightweight e a Ferrari. And uh, he liked that British thing, and he liked that class thing, the class of the car. I mean, not the people. The, the, the cars had to be beautiful cars. He drove all the best cars that you could get. But if he had been driving a Maserati or a Ferrari in Formula One races or in Grand Prix as they were in those days, he would have been world champion many, many times. The Van Wall nearly would have given it to him. But the rest of the BRM at that time wasn't successful. But if he had his, these so-called foreign cars in his mind, he just didn't want to do it. But you talk about a race that went on to define him being the Mille Emilia in 55. If we go to the season where it, it should have been, really, 1958, uh, and what happened at the Portuguese Grand Prix and the fact that he petitioned the stewards to get Mike Hawthorne re-established yeah. in, the, in the race, that, that was sterling to a T, was it not? See, that's a gentleman behaving like a gentleman. And I don't know who else would ever have gone to the stewards and said they were wrong and they should give the man his dutiful victory and points at the world championship that were going to take him away from being world champion, which he, he must have wanted to have. But you know what? Sterling Moss was so big that he didn't have to be world champion. <laughs> he was still the best driver in the world. And at that time, there was only Fangio. And Fangio wasn't doing the number of races. And, and Fangio never drove the number of racing cars that Sterling drove. I mean, forget the beginnings of the 500. But all the way through, he drove sports cars, GT cars, touring cars, Formula 2 cars, Formula... Obviously, three cars were the little ones in those days. But he did the Alpine Rally. He did all sorts of things 
the modern Grand Prix driver does 21 Grand Prix a year or whatever it might be. I mean, even in my day, I was doing 60, 70 races a year. Sterling Moss was driving them like that. That's, I was looking at Sterling Moss as if it was. That's the, that's the way you got to do it. I wanted to drive for John Coombs like he wanted to drive for a Tommy Sockwith or a, or, or a Rob Walker. He, he was just a great British guy. I, I would say British rather than English, of course. But he, he, he really was, and his style and everything else was right. There was, there was something else about him, wasn't there? I think he was one of the first proper professional drivers. Um, he was quite... Uh, uh, acute with the, the way he managed his uh, getting paid and so forth. I mean, he must have, you know, you famously were, were, were regarded as being a, you know, such a professional in that regard and taking it, taking it up a, a notch. But I think Sterling was like, uh, you know, he was the, the original, wasn't he, in that regard? Oh, yeah. Oh, he was, he was a professional uh, and, and he knew his values uh, and, he, and he had a manager. No other racing driver in those days, I don't think, had a manager. I mean, Fangio had Fima Rushman who helped him and did things with him, but he had a proper manager and he did commercials, like you said earlier. I'll never forget when he did the Craven A commercial, a cigarette commercial, for goodness sake. And he would be smoking on a racing car. <laughs> and he did all sorts of things of that kind. He was, the, I think, the first full professional racing driver. Even Juan Malfangio, who would be my ultimate hero. You know, Peron was paying for his drives and helping him and, and so forth. He wasn't, he was a great chooser of the right team to be with at the right time. But he, Sterling was a really commercial racing driver. At the same time, everybody's love you know, they loved Sterling Moss. Most of all, the women. He was the biggest mass, I mean, the biggest, ma oh, certainly the biggest magnet uh, I've ever seen of a racing driver with girls. They just, poof, busy times. The, fir the first time I met him was we were taking our trousers off in an office <laughs> oh. at the BRDC bungalow, putting well, our overalls on. Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> For, um, it was 1981. We were becoming teammates in the Works Audi team. I was 21. He was 51 at the time. And we're getting, getting changed in the BRDC bungalow that used to be at the beginning, uh, the entrance of Silverstone. He's like, hello, old boy. And uh, it was just a, such a privilege to be racing anywhere near him. And uh, He didn't like the front-wheel drive cars and slick tyres. No. He thought it just wasn't his thing. And he, I think he regrets coming back uh, to racing in the 80s. And, and he struggled a bit. Uh, except for one day at Brands Hatch when it was wet and cold and slippery as anything. I think somebody dropped some oil on the track and we didn't see which way he went. He was absolutely peerless because it was a sort of grip level he'd been used to in his career, i.e. not a whole lot. And he was just magic on that day. And we, we, we saw it for ourselves the rest of the time. I mean, the first test we did at Mallory Park, for example, uh, we turned up. And they'd spelt his name wrong on the side of the car. They spelt it as Pound <laughs> Sterling rather than Sterling Moss. And I'm sure Jackie can confirm, when Sterling wasn't happy about something, you knew about it. He, he knew right from wrong. He knew which way was up. And he would address it straight away. And it was, it was a feisty character. And I used to how love, he'd bring you, up, he'd bring up after get Grand the, Prix. How could you get the name wrong of Sterling <laughs> Moss? <you know? laughs> Somebody just, yeah, he went to the graphics guy or something. And, um, but he'd bring up after a Grand Prix, uh, if he didn't really enjoy the Grand Prix or he'd got an opinion or it, I'd said something in commentary he did or didn't agree with him and, the, and the, his darling wife, Lady Susie, would ring up and have a good old chat about it. He was right into F1 uh, uh, and until very recently, until after his illness started um, at the end of 2016. But Jackie, he was a feisty character, wasn't he? Oh, fantastic. I mean, in these later years, you know, he was, he was walking with great considerable pain. He had a little shooting stick that he would sit down on in the paddock. He would come to Australia. He would travel still uh, to races um, because it was a commercial life that he lived. And he was a good businessman. His real estate uh, properties that he has in London have been managed by him mainly, 
all that time. And, and he invested well. And he, he broke, I think, into the professional world of, of motorsport, not just Formula One, because everybody wanted Sterling Moss. Mercedes-Benz obviously used him a lot, but could have used him much more because it wasn't at that time what people are today being used, if you like, in the, in the profession. No, no, he was, he was a one of a kind. There's nobody like him. And so, Jackie, I think one thing we, we, we know uh, about Sterling as well was his ability to actually understand the car. Because I did a race with him in an XK, Jaguar XK120 uh, in Classic Le Mans, which I think was his first race win he ever had. And he was still under the bonnet, trying to sort out the suspension. I think he seemed to be so far ahead of everybody else in that era as well. Yeah, but he never, never bullied cars. He was one of those drivers, and that's the way I think we should all be. Uh, he was so smooth with the car that he would overrule some of the little elements of the motor car that we could have done without. Uh, Sterling could just get round it somehow. Uh, and again, he always had one mechanic. Now, here am I sitting with my dyslexia, and I can't remember his name. And you, one of you boys might remember it, but he had one particular mechanic that worked with him for very many years. What was his name? Can we think about that? No, I don't know him. Somebody yeah. watching this program will. But he had, I mean, it was like a, a, a royalty factor to have him with him. A, a, a great. The two of them together were, were dynamite. So, Jackie, before you uh, leave us for the day, can you just uh, there's a, a lovely photo in behind you. Is that Sir Sterling? Is that Lady Helen with him? When, when was yeah, that? Yeah, that from? I, I, if I bring it closer to you, maybe you can see it better. Um, yeah. It's still difficult, Sterling. I think it was in California, uh, at Riverside, because you know he he was the ambassador for um, uh, for the Can-Am, so he did an awful lot of races that I did, and Helen in those days of course, did a lot of races with me. And now I can't get this to stand up again. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to take it down. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, again, Helen thought he was marvellous. You know, I think every girl thought Sterling was marvellous. So he was just a colourful, dynamic, hugely attractive man. And I, I you know, all your our audience will, understand this because it's still used I think who do you think you are Sterling Moss you know when somebody's speeding and Sterling actually had a policeman say that to him because he was always going over the hill with speed tickets and this policeman stopped him and came in and just as he got in the car he didn't get in the car properly looking down he said who do you think you are Sterling Moss can you imagine that happening to yourself <laughs> Jackie, that's, just that's, that's how big he was. <laughs> a, a, a absolutely amazing character, but larger than life, and that, uh, and then that image will keep growing forever, won't it? But uh, you said you were with him four weeks ago. I know that Sterling hasn't spoken, uh, hadn't spoken for at least a year and a half. Is is uh, and and uh, Susie, Lady Moss, gave up every second of her oh. life this last three years to to care for him in the most extraordinary manner. Is it, is it blessed relief in the end that, he can, that he's been able to move on, do you think, in your view? Well, I spoke to, to uh, the, the, I heard the, the very first thing I got a call early in the morning from the British Racing Drivers Club, which actually, if you think about his commitment to the BRDC in Silverstone, and I got this call to tell me that Sterling died, I immediately called the number. And I said to Susie, oh dear, I've just heard the news, yes. And she was fantastic on the telephone. Sterling, I've been looking at, uh, visiting him regularly since he came in from Singapore, where he, where he got ill. And to begin with, he was fine and good conversation. It gradually diminished. And I would say for the last six or eight months, there was no recognition when I went in and sat down with him and just held his hand. Um, he wasn't there. And I think in the end, particularly for Susie and, and the family, 
um, I think it was a, a kindness for him to slip away as he did. And, and the whole world is celebrating his, his life. And he would have liked that, to be recognized in the fact that everything is doing it in such style and fashion. Look at this program being dedicated to Sterling Moore. So I think it was a kindness in the end, and I think it was a kindness for, for Susie. So Jackie, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I know it's trying circumstances, but it's also a joy to look back on what was an extraordinary life. So thank you once again for coming in and, uh, and speaking to us today. We, we wish you very well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sir Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. I think if we look to what, I suppose, the, the, the final words from, from you guys, but also from what Susie said yesterday, um, his wife, Lady Susie, said he, he died as he lived, looking wonderful. That was one of the, the things that he was. He was just, he was just so stylish. Whenever we met him, whenever he was in and around the paddock, as Sir, Sir Jackie was saying there, he just, he just always had a line for everybody, didn't he? Johnny, Martin. Yeah. Uh, we always had time for us all. I think that's what was amazing. It's not just us as ex-racing drivers, you, Simon, as a presenter. It was everybody. And I think that sort of really made him stand out because I think he had the love for the sport, but he had the love for the people that were coming to watch that sport as well. And I think that's something that I think was very much uh, respected. Yeah. If you go back to 1958, we didn't talk about it there, but one of the things I think gets lost, doesn't it, in the story of Mike Hawthorne and Portugal and losing the championship by one was the speed of the Cooper car that he had that year. He won four races. And in the end, it kind of precipitated the era of the Garage East, didn't it? And those that were able to take on um, Ferrari. I think it wasn't Enzo Ferrari said that the horse should always pull the cart, but actually, in the end, it moved the other way. And, and it was Sir Sterling in those great cars that, that, that started that era. Simon, I, I, in doing a little bit of research on, on this, um, uh, it was quite interesting to discover that uh, the Van Wall, uh, which was uh, the, the, the British entry that, that, that um, Sterling had so much hope of, you know, put so much hope in, um, one of the people who worked on that design, the car, that car, was Colin Chapman himself. And, um, and the aerodynamics were done by, um, not Mike Carlston, but his brother. And, um, you know, so the early, the seeds were sown there in that period um, for the, the, the domination of, of the of British, of the, of the sport in, you know, from Great Britain by British designers um, in the 60s. And so, so you know, his, his int maybe his, his kind of uh, quirky interest in, in technology and stuff was really, really crucial in, in kickstarting or getting, getting us uh, on, the st on the stage and putting Britain foremost in terms of manufacturing and racing cars. I've just had a text from uh, Sir Jackie's office uh, where he is at the moment. It's Al Francis, he wants us to know, was the name mm -hmm. of, the, uh, of the mechanic, uh, of uh, Sterling's famous mechanic. So we got that across in, in the program. <laughs> there, there. Apologies for not remembering, apologies for not remembering. But yeah, what, what was, do you think, I mean, the pull, if you think about it, Alfred Neubauer and, and Mercedes, there was, there was one season he, he went across, he was Fangio's teammate, he's his rival for six years, but for that one year to go up against him, and then to be a, a, you know, a man of admission, he said, look, he was better than me, he was straight out better than me, and the winning entry, there's always that controversy, so Sterling always said, you let me win that one, I think it was 0.2 of a second between them in the end, but he had to go up against one of the greatest of all time, and and, but it was also a bit of a mentor. I think the relationship between Fangio and that was was a really good one. Yeah, I think I think studying to him uh, a lot and um, and almost felt he should finish second to the great man from time to time. And, and when he won at Aintree in '55, as you say, he wondered if he'd let him win. If Fangio had let him win, but I think Sterling was better than that. I think that he, that was just the humility he had as a man, as a just the the decency the gentleman has has it out where but you know fangio was a maestro in those cars and they were monsters to drive i mean absolute uh, monsters and and you know you could see the drivers of that era i mean sterling was a bit of a whippet compared to these guys and um you know they were really quite chunky weren't they back in those days ascari and gonzalez and uh, and all of those people fangio too so i think you um you know, they used to pick those things up by the scruff of the neck. Their races were so long as well. I mean, the the race that Sterling won in Monaco 60, uh, 61 was 
three and a bit hours or something. Extraordinarily physical times um, they were back then. No seatbelts, of course, and no, nothing around them. No hydration uh, inside the car during during the event. So um, they they were pioneering times, and I think that's why. To answer your question fully, there, Simon, that's why somebody like Sterling at the top of his game in a nimble car, wherever it came from, could could beat the might of uh, Ferrari uh, uh, or Mercedes Benz uh, when he was when he was you know delivering up that kind of magic. I want to go back to the Mille Miglia, um, a thousand miles through Italy, and what Sir so Jackie was saying. I know you've done it, Martin. Have you guys done it, Johnny? No, you guys haven't, you haven't done it. I know you did it, didn't you, back with Bruno Senna? But one of the things that stands out is that you guys all know that you get to know all the turns on particular circuits, but it would take you two days to do a practice lap of the Mille Miglia because of the sheer length of it. So you're driving on instinct, I imagine, and to beat Fanjo by over half an hour shows the raw talent of the man, does it not? I mean, that's, that's probably why it was his defining drive. Up to you, Damon. I was going to say, it shows talent, but also brave, enormous bravery. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Dennis Jenkinson famously navigated, but I mean, to sit next to a guy, and he's, the average speed was 97 miles an hour, uh, and it still stands as a record. So uh, you wouldn't get me doing that. Um, I'm sure Martin would love to do it, but I, 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 I take my hat off to you, Martin. But... Um, Frankly, you know, open roads. I did. I mean, Sterling was was um, was uh, politically incorrect sometimes, and he would uh, he would talk about sometimes the the spectators would stand by the end of the track, and uh, he'd try not to try not to clip them if he could. But um, you know, there was all sorts of hazards around that race that uh, that, that were not for the faint-hearted. So in, extraordinary bravery to just yeah. uh, even enter it. It shows the skill of Sterling because when you talk of Sterling and, and Sir Jackie, Jackie was always so he would go as fast as he needed to go. Sterling was always able to drive on that very, very edge in that very, very dangerous era uh, of those 50s and sort of early 60s. So that was where I think you saw, saw that real driver skill, that bravery, but that belief uh, at the same time. And I think that's something I definitely remember uh, seeing on some of the, uh, the videos I've seen. He, he was he was like you, wasn't he, Johnny? I mean, you're a seat of the pants guy. I think I think Sterling was a seat of the pants driver. You know, he just threw himself in there and just let his instincts uh, take care of himself. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, famously, Dennis Jenkinson, of course, um, when they wrecked the route, put it on like a very long till roll or toilet roll, if you like, <laughs> and and that's how they did it. But uh, I we did Bruno Senna and I did the Milan a, a few years ago, but it's now over four days. Uh, the event and we were still exhausted at the end of it he did it in just over 10 hours the thousand miles and and yeah on dusty roads flat out as you said Damon I think it was 97 98 98 point something miles an hour average and uh, the, you know the, the the danger involved of people dying left right and center in, the, in this event um, and he just he just hustled it through and, and just stuck with it I mean he had the mental and physical tenacity that was extraordinary you alluded to it in the very beginning of the of this vodcast johnny about how strong he was in the head and um you know an all-time amazing human athletic performance uh, that he that he put in there and just before we go then guys again let's just i know you've got a what well, that picture behind you martin is that is that the two of them in the is it the w196s yeah it is it's an alan stammers print signed by uh, Fanjo and Moss, the pair of them, um, which is, I've, uh, I've got a few things and some lovely letters that Sterling sent me over the years on, on various things um, that I absolutely treasure and of course treasure even more now um, because he, he was a very generous man. He was a very outgoing man uh, it, 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 within our motorsport family, especially. So um, yeah, that, that's, what, that's what that's all about in, in the background there. Damien, you got any from, uh, from early on, from China? Well, I mean, I've seen a few of them. They, they, there are a few knocking around, but they're from those great parties that you, your father used to throw. When you were uh, yeah, my, my dad was, uh, was famous for, uh, for throwing the parties and having the police turn up and, uh, and then join in. Uh, but that was in the good old days. But this is, this is one from my christening. It was taken at my christening. And that's, uh, uh, that's actually, you can see there a few famous names in there, Sterling Moss. Uh, I'm, I think that's right to left. I'm, and then next to him is Taffy Von Tripp's, my, my dad, myself, and then Joe Bonnier, 
Tony Brooks and and uh, and Bruce McLaren. But um, yeah, we got the same birthday. I'm very proud to say I got. That. I used to get a, a birthday card from Sterling and Susie, which is very kind of them, <laughs> um, on the same day. But um, he'll be much missed. Uh, he's he's left an incredible legacy. What an incredible man! And um, and so Jackie, I think, summed him up. You know, he's he was an extraordinary individual, and we, we love being with Sterling. And uh, I'm very lucky to get to know him a bit better towards the end of his life. Yeah, wonderful stuff. Uh, final words again from then you, Johnny, and, and Martin on the great man. Yeah, well, it, it's something you know. I saw a video recently, 1955, that W196, uh, and him racing uh, Fangio then. So I, you know, it goes so far back for me with those early days of racing. And I still have a picture with the number seven uh, on the side of his race car, the famous number seven that he had. Uh, but it was the man uh, that was just so, so special and just so nice that I have all those lovely memories. Martin? Uh, yeah, it's the finality of death, isn't it? It's the bit I hate. And, and, and then whilst we did know him well and lots of correspondence and that, I just wish I'd have spent more time with him or, or you know, I did. I was lucky enough to eat at his home, and that. Why didn't I eat ten times more at his home? And and, and so I'm going through those sort of moments right now of, you know, trying to grab something because it's gone and it's gone forever that that we all experience when we lose people that matter a lot to us. Um, on the flip side of that coin, what a privilege it was to to know him and and share. 0.001 percent of his life, uh, and and what, what a gift it is to us all and and as I say I think his image the iconic name um, apparently that he was going to be called Hamish at one point but I think Sterling Moss worked an absolute treat for him and uh, he, he will for all for all time be one of the greatest uh, racing drivers and one of the most charismatic sports sportsmen ever. Thank you to all uh, for coming on and sharing some of those stories and looking back on a life uh, worth living. It really was a truly uh, memorable one, wasn't it? Uh, and a big thank you to Sir Jackie Stewart for also coming on and sharing his memories. He's survived by his daughter Alison, son Elliot, and Lady Susie, of course. Uh, from us all here, it's rest in peace, Sir Sterling.